Hmm. Now, at the same time, things are not as restrictive and as bad as people make it out to be in terms of China. Hmm. I've just had brothers and sisters I've talked to here. Hmm. They are very appreciative of this country. Okay. Things get done in this country. Okay. So in, when the, the party decides they want to build, you know, want to put money towards, you know, trying to stop out poverty levels, that they want to build new high-speed rails and trains and buildings and, you know, build up their capability, it, it's no question they just do it. They just move forward. I see. And so Shanghai, as well as China as well, I mean, it's just developing in such a quick pace because, you know, you have a unified front. So there is such a thing as groupthink being a positive thing, too, if we really think about it. Because mm -hmm. we are, you know, uh, proud of our individualism in terms of Americans and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we also see, like, you know, sometimes how that can cause conflict. So it's trying to find that happy medium somewhere where we can build consensus but still maintain or retain our individuality as well. been quite some time since we've been together but I'm happy to be back as you know this is the Jed Institute of Learning the Jedi Learning Show with your host Baba Kintu and today's episode goes by the name of if you keep digging you'll end up in China I know a lot of y'all gonna dig this one now I have to start off with a little disclaimer this was actually supposed to be an old episode years years old but I'm redoing the intro and I'm putting it out anyway because it's almost like it was a prophecy so when you guys get to the interview you'll see exactly what I'm talking about but I gotta give you guys some of the details this is the Jet Institute of Learning and if you want to reach us all you have to do is go to our website that's the best thing to do. JediLearning.com. D J E D I L E A R N I N G.com. If you get there, you will have access to all the information, whether it be social media, phone number, email address, YouTube. It's all there. But two I would like to highlight are the Instagram page, which we update regularly, and that is at Jedi Learning, same spelling as I just gave you for the website. And then the YouTube page is Jedi, one word, and then learning. Okay, first name Jedi, last name learning. Go to those two. Those are the main active ones. The rest of them, they're there. We will answer to any of them. And you know what, just to throw it out there, our phone number, if you want to reach us, is 909-576-0170. If somebody calls us and leaves, leaves us a message, either a voicemail or gives us a text, we'll make sure to shout you out on the next episode. Now, where are we at? We are in the age of what? A lot of people say the age of Aquarius. A lot of people say the age of Pisces. But we're under the sun sign currently of Pisces. Or oh, wait a minute. Are we in the sun sign of Aries? Now this is kind of tricky. Because today happens to be the spring equinox. My favorite day of the year. It's a celebration. I wish I had some air horns and whistles to go off. And some beats to throw right about now. But it's okay. I did my daily meditation. As well as my aerotherapy. Uh, in my rope this morning. So. No problem there. But with that comes the idea that the first day of spring, the spring equinox, 
is supposed to be the very beginning of the next constellation, which is Aries. But since we had a leap year this year, that has been all thrown out of whack. So it's a little bit earlier, March 19th. Okay. Now, we're just getting out of Pisces, or technically we're still in Pisces, depending on how you want to look at it. And with that comes a carefree, creative energy, very um, follow the gut, very, very intuitive, very smart, funny, creative. Okay, we're coming from that energy. Also can be a little bit too lax sometimes, can be a little bit non-serious when things need to be serious. Also seeming to have two personalities because we're talking about the two fish. Okay, and this date, the two, the symbol of the two fish is extremely ancient, going all the way back to ancient Egypt, ancient Africa, back to about 2800 before the common era, painted on coffins. Okay, but that's just that. But we're going into a time of Aries. Now we're talking about straightforward. We're talking about go getter. We're talking about uh, taking initiative. We're talking about even being stubborn at some points. When we talk about the ram, Aries, we also talk about Amun, the hidden one. That was a deity in ancient Egypt that was represented by the ram. And those horns represented the god Amun, or the hidden one. You say amen at the end of your prayers now. Amin, amen, every major Western religion, or should I say uh, Abrahamic faith, ends with amen. Paying homage to the most ancient deity from Nubia, or the Sudan, which is Amen. Amen also has connections to the brain where if you look up the Amen's horns, it's located near the hippocampus, which is also represented, representative of memory. Okay, so having a good memory, having a good memory, staying on course, staying focused, having purpose, opportunity, taking advantage of the opportunity. That's what's coming up. That's what we're on the brink of. We're, we're teetering on both right now. We're on the equinox. We have it balanced, but we're about to tip it over one step. Okay. So that was just to line it up. Now, remember, we're here to resurrect communities through superior education. So we will be looking at the world through the lens of the seven liberal arts or the ancient African educational system or the wisdom system. And that is the subjects of grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. So remember those because they will come up often. And we had to locate ourselves where we were not only in time, but also in space. So that's how we had to break that down. But as we continue, we have a dynamite show packed for you today. Might blow some people's heads off, twist wigs back, open caps up like a Muppet. And I want to get into the news because this news is some of it is kind of disturbing, but some of it is right on point and it's right where we need to be focused on at this point in time with all these distractions going on, major distractions. And now that it's a wrap, I hate to break that news to you. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. The first one I want to bring up is about supporting home learning in elementary grades. Okay, everybody's at the house right now. Everybody that became a makeshift teacher out there uh, with the you know glasses on the rim of their nose, looking down at the kids, telling them to sit still, and uh, threatening them with detention. Or no recess. <laughs> it's really not about to be no recess pretty soon in a couple of weeks. But everybody's playing this role right now. What do you do if it's been 30, 20, 40, 50 years since you've taught early elementary and you have children that are early elementary grades? Well, one thing you can do is probably go to your district website and look up some learning opportunities if they have them available. But another thing you can do is pick up this article called How to Support Home Learning and early elementary grades. Now, this is something that we posted on our uh, Instagram page, and you can go download it from there, or you can go straight to it. And it's from Edutopia, March 17th, by John S. Thomas. And it's an excellent article because it not only breaks down what home learning is about, 
It's about what happens in this situation where people are kind of anxious, people are not sure about the future. How do you reassure them that everything is going to be okay? One thing you want to do is communicate. If you are a teacher, if you are the person leading the home learning, you let everybody that you're working with know, whether it be other families or your families or just your your main core, you know, your village. Just let them know everything is going to be okay. Communicate with them often. Get a routine going. Make sure that things get back to a simple routine as quick as possible. This is one way to get over any type of crisis. In any type of crisis response, one thing you want to do is get back to your routine as quick as possible. So make sure you do things. This, let's say you're recording videos. You record in the same spot that you always record. There's no time to switch up and bring something new out. You want to let them feel at home. So if you got that old grease can in the back with the fish oil in it, Keep that back there while you teach and cooking. Don't take it out because you want to be a little bit more polished. No, people want to see you how you are. And they also want to know that things are the same. There are going to be changes, but for the most part, things are going to be the same. Things are going to be OK. So you got to create that sense of familiarity. OK. Also, another thing you can do is just ask them how they're doing. It's not only about academics. It's also about that social emotional piece. You know, how you feeling? Um, you know, what's your inner wet weather looking like today? Are you a happy face? Or are you a sad face? Just checking in at a level that they understand and they'll respond in kind. OK, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down or thumbs halfway. Right. Hands up, hands down, hands in the middle. They love to express themselves, especially those early children. So give them that opportunity, um, even if it's through art. Even if it's through writing, if they rather write, if they rather text you, if they rather make a short video for you about how they feel, let them do that. They have to get it out so they can get back to their routine. OK, uh, another thing you can do is get started on academics to get back into their routine. So when you want to do that, you don't want to cause too much stress. Start at a level that they can do. OK, if they add, don't try to hit them with algebra because you say, oh, I, I got the time now. I'm about to be at the house and you about to be brilliant. You about to ace all the tests next year. So we about to start you off at algebra. No, if they can't add, add and subtract, then they can't multiply and divide. If they can't multiply and divide, they can't do algebra. So don't skip those steps. Start off where they're at or even lower just to get them back used to doing things. That might be a little bit challenging, but still are very rewarding when they figure out how, the solutions and how to do things successfully. So start off easy. Ease on to it. Ease on down the road. OK, this is the yellow brick road, the time of opportunity. We are heading into Aries and we have to take advantage. So um, if you get a chance to do some face to face, um, get those real vibrations going, let them see you on video, give them a call. Um, if you're there, touch them, reach out and touch them. Let them know everything's going to be OK. You can now teach. This is the best part. You can now teach with real hands on, which means you can now give hugs. You can now give feedback like a pat on the back. You might even, um, you know, stroke the head, stroke the hair, do whatever feels necessary to reinforce. Also showing love, things that would be questionable from a teacher to a student in a public high school or a public elementary school for that matter. Uh, you know, that hasn't stopped a whole lot of teachers or students from engaging in that with each other. But in this case, you want to try to go around that and just do it to the ones that you love. OK, it comes out more genuine and it's less likely to be misinterpreted. So those are just some things you can do real quick to get your home learning together. We will be guiding you through this process, so there is no need to be apprehensive about what's going on once again this is a time of opportunity let us show you let us help you reach out and ask us if you need anything because we are here to provide you with what you need this might be a long journey ahead so you may as well listen to somebody who's been preparing for this for quite some time you have experience and we are not going to lead you into a situation where we don't know what's going on Keep you activated with the energy and the information as we get it. That's what we're all about. So now, now that we got that under our belt, we want to step to the next place, which is 
the death of the resume. Now, this is a blog post that is featured on our website. Go down to JediLearning.com and download from our blogs, the death of the resume. And you might be saying, what are you talking about? But it's actually perfect for what's going on right now once again. Now, what do you mean by that? Resumes are no longer going to uh, indicate what you did and who you know and what school you went to and what you graduated with and what activities you were engaged in and all the superfluous information that might give you an, uh, the person an idea of what hobbies you're into and what a well-rounded person you are, but it don't let them know what you can actually do. So what's happening now, micro-credentials, and we'll get more specific into what those are in a second, but what they do essentially is let an employer know exactly what skills you have qualified for in order for you to access um, what's called maybe an interview or access an opportunity at the job. So they're not worried so much anymore about your background. They want to know what you can do. So if you've been able to pass a test saying that you can demonstrate proficiency in Microsoft Office, Excel, and PowerPoint, that's all they want to know. Your micro-credential will show that. How are they getting this information to put on a micro-credential is the next part, and this is where things get tricky. They're giving tests online. So, in order for you to have a micro-credential on LinkedIn or Indeed, you have to take one of these tests. And once you get tested, then it lets the employers know who are looking for these certain job skills, who has them, and then they hook them up. Sounds good, but once again, these standardized tests can be discriminatory against those who are not participating in the development of the tests, which means black, brown, minorities, uh, any people who are not in the development and the implementation of the screening process. So let's go ahead and tap into it and let's see what exactly we're talking about here when we talk about the death of the resume. And I just want to get into a little bit of it. We won't go too deep because you can read the rest for yourself. But what I want to get into is uh, the discrimination piece we just talked about. So I'm just going to read this one little piece of the paragraph so you get an idea and a feel. So it says, it has been argued that the use of these skills assessments will decrease the bias in the hiring process. The argument being that since candidacy will be based on skills and not on an evaluator who picks a candidate, human biases will not play a part in the selection process. Those on the other side of the argument indicate that an assessment tool is just as biased as its developers. And that's absolutely correct. Just look at all the shenanigans we're going through right now with the algorithm, where if you punch in pictures of things like Michelle Obama, you'll get tons of gorillas. So you'll say, well, it's not a human doing that. That's what's coming up on the algorithm. And that's the problem. The algorithm is being developed by certain people. So it's unconscious biases also come out in the algorithm, even if it hasn't been directly programmed to do so. Same here with the hiring process and these skills assessments. I continue. As a result. The bar of success for these tests will not only rest on how well, how well they match skill sets with open positions, but how fairly this process is carried out. And the fairer that the process seems, the more likely it will be that mass adoption takes place. So we're in an environment right now where you're not probably about to go to an interview for quite some time. So you can forget about that, at least in the next two months or so. So micro credentials, skills assessments, it is. Part of the gamification of the workforce as well as the educational process where things are becoming gamified, turn into games so that you can earn badges and skills points for learning certain skills, which is not necessarily bad. But you have to be very, very careful because he who controls the environment controls the behavior in it. So let's continue to our final article here and remember that last one who shot the resume was by Bobby Kintu October 18th 2019 and this last one I want to bring to everybody's attention 
I just had to take a deep breath because it really upsets me when I see things like this. Because we've been talking about this for quite some time, but people still think that we plan. And this is seven-year-old boy beaten by bullies in class. Teacher records video. Now, I watched this video repeatedly. And it starts off kind of funny at first. But then it turns into some sick, twisted, demented Lord of the Flies in the hood type situation where a kid is being picked on. It sounds like he's usually the whiny bully. Everybody wants to see the whiny bully upset, but then everybody turns on him and it becomes a mob mentality, but it takes place in the hood. Obviously, uh, most of the people, if not all of the people in the video are of African descent. And it says that the teacher recorded it. But from my perspective and my experience, um, with technology and iPads and recording equipment, it sounds like a young person is actually doing the recording, one of the classmates, which leads me to my next point, which is taking devices to school and home. Uh, this is what the repercussions are. Instead of using them to better their learning skills and develop processes that will enable, enable them to be creative and come to their best abilities they're using them to record each other getting jumped and clowned okay this is and so it's probably a reason why your public schools got blew up and you probably should be happy about it okay this is the transition period we just told you we're going from pisces on into aries so you might as well take the bull by the horns in this case the ram by the horns and ride it on out so I would highly suggest that you go and check out this article and watch the video, too, because it lets you know, once again, what's going on in your public schools. OK, a lot of physicality. So I'm going to go into it really quick uh, and I'm just going to read the article, but I want you to watch the video. A seven year old boy from a Michigan public school is going viral on social media after a video surfaced which shows him being jumped and beaten by his classmates was an adult in the room apparently recording a video. Now, if, if that is an adult, it got to be Michelet because it sounds like uh, one of the seven year olds. The incident reportedly occurred inside a second grade class at the International Academy at Hull in Benton Harbor, Michigan. OK. The video shows the second grader whom uh, the news will not name being punched and kicked by his classmates and the attack is brutal. The little boy was kicked in the private area, then placed in a headlock while the other classmates taunted and punched him. Most shockingly, the video appears to be recorded by an adult as her voice can be heard in the video. Now, the news has confirmed that the victim's mom, Carmisha Ellis, has seen the video and notified the school. According to her, the adult in the video, whom she calls the teacher, has been placed on paid administrative leave. The child's mother also gave this quote. If this video never surfaced, if these second graders had never recorded this, he would have been in the school today with the same teacher again. She also went on to say, um, actually, the child's father said, and his name is Dontavius Tyler. He wants to kill himself after this. And that's not something you want to hear from your child who's seven years old. And I would agree 1000 percent with that. Um, not only do we have an increase on brothers and sisters of young age attempted to commit suicide, but it's usually because of bullying. And later on, this type of behavior that he experienced can turn him into the perpetrator on somebody else. Okay. So the International Academy at Hull is a public school located in Benton Harbor, Michigan. It has 342 students in grades K through 2 with a student teacher ratio of 19 to 1. According to nice.com, the state test scores determined that 90% of the students are not proficient in math and 85% are not proficient in reading. Niche.com also gives the school a D plus. So you shouldn't be too surprised as to what was going on in there. So that was the news for today. Um, it was enlightening. It wasn't all happy news. But it is letting you know that this time for an educational transition is something that you need to take advantage of. Because not only do you see how things are rapidly changing around you, you see what the old way was doing. And it wasn't that great. This might be just what you needed to snap you out of that dream 
and wake you up into a new reality. And part of that new reality is the micro-credential. Now you heard me mention the micro-credential a little bit earlier, but what exactly is a micro-credential? I'm going to head to digitalpromise.org micro-credentials, okay? Because we're now in the section of the teachings of tomorrow. This is a section where we deal with what education is going to look like in the future. Where are things going? Where are the trends headed? Where do you need to be? And where do you position yourself in order to be at the cutting edge of educational opportunities? This is the teachings of tomorrow. Now, when we talk about this micro-credential, once again, it goes with the theme of the gamification of the workforce and of the educational system. Now, I'm going to give you a definition from the micro-credential issuers. Uh, Let me see if I can find just a straight definition. Okay. Individuals develop new skills while working and are seeking opportunities to be recognized for their professional growth. Research suggests that traditional frameworks and models for recognizing professional growth and providing professional advancement opportunities don't meet the needs of today's workers. Micro-credentials provide a pathway to personalizing and recognizing professional learning. They allow employers to verify the skills their employee demonstrate, regardless of where and how they learn them. So you can see that's also going to put a big, big damper on higher education and a big, big damper on these colleges and universities unless they start to take control of the micro-credential process. Because if you can now be certified without having an actual degree, if you are uh, Tommy um, Johnson from Accra, Ghana, who just came over here and you can barely speak English and you, um, you know, don't have a whole lot as far as financial and material wealth, but you have these coding skills. If you meet the criteria, you can get a job. You can be employed. The opportunity is going to be endless. And who say you might not even have to come to the United States in order to do that job with everything being digital. So it's a way to verify skill sets without having to go to a university or USC. So that job that went to Tommy from Accra uh, could have only gone to maybe somebody who graduated from Stanford, Harvard, MIT, um, or one of the other schools that specialize in um, coding and the software development and software engineering. Now, if you just go to Digital Promise and you kind of scroll up and down their website, you can start to see uh, little different things in paragraphs that kind of describe what the micro, micro credential is also by, uh, was all about. Research backed. Each micro credential is grounded in sound research that illustrates how that competency supports positive professional impact. Um, personalized, I think that's key, with more than 450 micro-credentials available in the Digital Promise ecosystem, learners can select the ones that are best aligned to personal goals or professional needs. Now, I will say that I did reach out to them. The Jet Institute of Learning did reach out to them to see what the process was to get us identified as a micro-credential issuer or what that process was like. And they want us to know more about our organization first. So um, <laughs> that could already tell you, um, you know, who knows? Might tell them and they might want to jump and work with us. Or you could tell them and they can say, um, sorry, we're not interested for obvious reasons. But anyway, the micro-credential is coming. It is your degree of tomorrow. And it's a degree not on your total body of knowledge, but on a single skill set. So each one of your skill sets get a degree in the micro-credential process. And that's why it's called a micro-credential. Okay, you get many credits, baby credits. For doing the baby steps, you get a baby credit. I think that's cool because once again, it allows more people access. Uh, and it cuts out this big, gigantic conglomerates called universities. Um, that put everybody in debt and uh, don't teach you nothing or very little is that because I can't say that because I went there but hey what do I know 
Now, what we are about to do is listen to a very, very profound brother. Uh, I met this brother at a conference, a psychology conference, early on in my career. We continued to be really good friends, and he had a terrific opportunity to go across the world to work in China after graduating in graduate school. So we chat with him while he's in China about the educational process, Africans in China, and just the entire political and social structure. And it's going to be very, very interesting because, like I said, this is maybe two or three years old, but I'm deciding to put it out now because of what's going on. It's so profound. Um, like I said, it was almost like a prophecy. This brother's uh, uh, credentials range from licensed educational psychologist, which I might have to or, uh, congratulate him on for just passing that exam, um, and to a world-renowned TED Talk speaker. So go look up his TED Talks. His name is Jeremy Green. He is a licensed educational psychologist out of Southern California. But this interview takes place while he was in China so you get to get an inside version of what takes on uh, what goes on and what takes place inside of the big east because if you keep digging you'll end up in china Yeah, okay, so everything is sounding good. How's everything sounding on your end? Uh, I can hear you loud and clear, man. Oh, that's perfect. Okay, sound like you're right here with me. Okay, that's excellent. <laughs> that's fantastic. All right. Well, uh, family, you tuned into the Jedi Learning Show. We are here with Brother Jeremy Green, school psychologist all the way out from Shanghai, China. Um, <laughs> this brother is going to bring us some insight from the East. Um, make sure we have uh, everything uh, in place for our relationship with the Chinese. We're going to talk about some current topics. We're going to talk about whatever he want to talk about, whatever I want to talk about. And uh, I hope you all enjoy this. Um, and I'm going to let this brother introduce himself because um, he has a lot of information to give and a lot of personality to go with it. So without any further ado, Brother Jeremy Green, how you doing today? I'm doing good, fam. I'm doing real good. Just, you know... Uh Right now we're at 12, 10 p.m. Okay. On a Monday out here. It's our last week at the Shanghai American School where I work at. Okay. So we're here in the elementary school side of things, and they're uh, the kids, you know, enjoying themselves on their field day. So they're okay. running outside, and you know, they're swim outfits and their shorts. And yeah. Slapping yeah. around and just you know having a good, good last you know week because our like I said, on Wednesdays our last official day in school. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, yeah, man, you know, well, first of all, what's your time like? Because I don't want to, you know, want to make sure we, we respect your time limits. I got, I got at least an hour, man. Okay. I'm, I'm here. All right, <laughs> good, good. No, that's perfect. Well, I have people pop into my office and try to tell me something, but uh, okay. I got time, so I might have to shoot them away. So, hey, we on your times, so let us know. Yeah, I'll let you know. If we got to hide in the closet for a few minutes, just let us know, and, you know, we'll go ahead and do that, okay? Yeah, no worries, man, no worries. We good. All right, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Okay, so, you know, before we got on, we was jot, you know, throwing some ideas back and forth, yeah, talking about labels. Uh, we touched on a, a few things with regards to not only special ed, but just um, labels in general, political, how they can be um, helpful in allowing people to define things, but how sometimes they can also separate by putting delineations between things that may not have been there before. Um, I also want to touch on uh, some interesting things that have been happening lately around um, suicide. 
that's a hot topic and we you know as, as two psychologists we definitely got to have a discussion on that especially from a, a African American African Chinese perspective African African perspective and um you know see what what sift some through some of that information but um you know we're going to do one thing at a time and you just I guess we'll start off right there with um you know this labeling that we was we can just kind of continue that conversation and um, you know you were saying allowing access you were, you were basically giving some of the good and the benefits to labeling so if you can go ahead and continue to break that down and uh, show some of your perspective on that I mean well labeling I mean uh, you know from a special education standpoint even here at an international school like Shanghai American School so to get a kind of a perspective of this school we have pre-k you know three so preschoolers that are three years old up to 12th grade so I serve all three divisions we have about 1700 students here so it's a big 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 school but the thing about this kind of school says it is one of the top tier international schools in the game mm. you talk to a lot of people internationally they'll say the same thing that most people will spend their whole life internationally mm-hmm. and these international schools to try to get to a school like Shanghai American School and then there's up to a lot of his reputation too in terms of like you got the best of the best in terms of teachers and staff curriculum the students are driven and things of that nature but at the same time, what you see with some of our student population when they don't fit, you know, uh, the mold, if you will. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we have mostly a Chinese and Korean kind of, you know, uh, student population here. Okay. Even though it's an international school, and we have American passport holders and Canadian passport holders and, you know, UK and New Zealand and so forth. I mean, we are pretty diverse, but the majority of our population is some of our Asian, you know, uh, families here within yeah. this uh, continent and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, they're coming from, you know, a unique perspective themselves in terms of, you know, driven in terms of academics and education. And, you know, in order to be successful, we go to college, you go to a four-year university out the gate. Mm-hmm. I mean, these parents, you know, also, you know, because we have a pretty uh, high level of tuition in terms of, you know, last time I checked, it was around 30000 USD. Oh, so a what? Not, uh, per year. Oh, my God. Because it's a private school, yeah. And people, just to put that in perspective, that's a brand new Lexus per year. That <laughs> is a, what well, What else? A mortgage for the year. You know, if you've got a 300000 or $400,000 mortgage, that's your yearly yeah. mortgage bill for a lot of people. I, would just, yeah. I want to put a little perspective on that. That's a lot of money. So I'm going to let you continue. No, sorry to, yeah. for interrupting. Yeah. No, you're good, man. If people can see outside my window right now, they see them BMWs and Teslas. Mm. Yeah. I see Maseratis here all the day, you mm. know, Aston Martin I saw here at this school the other day. So the parents are highly successful and highly affluent. Yeah. You know, you got CEOs, you have people that have started, you know, Fortune 500 companies, real estate, things of that nature. But what you see here, and going back to the labels perspective, is that since all these students are expected to follow, um, you know, the same kind of game plan, even though we're WASC accredited, even though a lot of our curriculum comes from the states and things of that nature, when those kids are not fitting, you know, that game plan, then you get, you know, some of our partners in terms of education that will start to feel like, you know, something must be wrong with this child. Yeah. So recently we went through an internal uh, audit to kind of, you know, figure out what we can do to, you know, strengthen our learning support services, which is basically our special education model okay. within, the school, uh, within the school hallways. Yeah. <clears throat> because uh, what we found in this audit review was that a lot of, you know, some of the perspectives from some of our colleagues here at the Shanghai American School is very medical, it's prescriptive. I it's see. Very, you know, okay, there must be something wrong with this child. Mm-hmm. And then you have, unfortunately, some teachers who are not trained from the same lens as either you or I, mm-hmm. trying to make assumptions and uh, calls of reading di- disabilities, so calling it dyslexia, even yeah. though we know in the DSM-5 is kind of a throwaway term. You know, yeah. we got read impairment, specific learning disorder, and then yeah. you mentioned dyslexia, just kind of a throwaway because I think the parents' groups for dyslexia were really, really strong and didn't want to yeah. get rid of them. You're in the current yeah. DSM-5, you know, our Diagnostic Statistical Manual or whatever, in terms yeah. of our bot, for yeah. clinical diagnosis and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, okay. the, problem, it, you know, the problem is you get people all the time that, are, like I said, want to try to ascribe labels such as dyslexia or selective mutism or autism, mm-hmm. or, autism mm-hmm. or ADHD who don't necessarily have the training that either you or I have or specifically a clinical psych or a PsyD or a neuropsych or whoever makes such a judgment call. Even an LEP, a licensed educational psychologist, can make those kind of judgment calls, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so what we have here is like, you know, you have good-hearted people that are trying to figure out 
you know, what is going on with the child without really considering the whole child, the holistic approach. Hmm. I mean, these are things that, you know, in our training as school psychologists from California, in terms of specific learning disability in general, we are trained to consider the whole child. Absolutely. So that's just, you know, processing tests or IQ tests, which we know are biased to begin with and have a history in eugenics and things like that. There you go. Uh, it's also seeing that, okay, this serves a purpose, but it's not the main bread and butter. Uh -huh. So how is the family unit? How is the language skills? Is the kid even proficient in English? Mm -hmm. Which a lot of tests are, you know, standardized. Yeah. English-based American students. Yeah. And that's just what's that. So in reality, in terms of even doing the testing that I'm doing here, uh -huh. regardless if the kid has a U.S. passport and speaks fluent English, yeah. that kid might have never been in the public school system in the U.S., so they might not even be part of that standardized, they standardized, uh, Good point. You know, you know what I think that's a good point you bring up and I think about that all the time you know we use these IQ tests and standardized tests in general I don't care if you're talking about emotional stability I don't care if you're talking about adaptive skills a, a cognitive academic if it's standardized basically you take in about 5,000 people giving them the test and based on their performance extrapolating that to everybody else which may be millions and millions of people so basically you're saying I could have skipped your entire county entire um, city entire state might not have anybody representative of you in this particular sample but I can still use it because I have a statistically significant number to then go ahead and apply it to you I have a problem with that personally um, and I think a lot of statisticians would as well because they understand how numbers can be uh, manipulated um, oh, yeah. you know I just wanted to add on a little bit to that because that's a little something that get up under my skin right there that's true too I mean we, 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 I know you're big with numbers and I'm big with numbers too and you know breaking down the science of the mathematics one time I mean you can have you know some of these books that I'd be seeing in terms of some of our more common you know standardized tools and assessment measures mm -hmm. I mean you can see the populations and how they break them down and it's the majority white population, which is the yeah. majority population in the states. Yeah. But at the same time, we also know the research shows that there's an overrepresentation of black and brown students, mm -hmm. especially education. Yeah. And you see there's a possible underrepresentation in terms of standardization of these students. There you go. And also considering that not all black students or brown students growing up in poverty. Uh -huh. They might be middle class. They might be upper class. Uh -huh. They might be African in terms of not speaking the English language and just Absolutely. transferred over to the U.S. Uh -huh. as a kid and things like that. And the cultural kind of customs and traditions uh -huh. that come from that. So, I yeah. mean, it's, it's a little difficult to do such a standardized kind of process in yeah. my opinion. You know, with humans that are so varied and have such different narratives. Yeah. Now, it's a little easier when they're doing it like a medical, like, okay, we're going to do, you know, a, 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 you know, a sample trial run of a new cancer drug or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because at our core level, as yeah. humans, you know, there's not that much percentage of a difference that makes us, you know, different in terms of visually, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's just a, what they call it, the phenotype, if I'm remembering yeah. correctly. Yeah, how you just, how the, how the genes express themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And there's not that much of a difference when we break it down to the core science of that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of things that are very, you know, abstract in nature. I mean, the human brain, as much as we studied about it, mm. we we won't have an untapped, the, you know, the true essence of the human brain. Just like we Talk have an about untapped it. true essence of space or even the ocean as well. That's, so that's excellent pretty point. pretty symbolic and universal in a way, right? It, it, it really know? is. You know, whenever I think about just psychology in general, it's really like a, it's a, if we know the history and we look into it, it is very spiritual in nature because yeah. you're talking about people's innate capabilities. And a lot of that was prescribed to spirituality prior to the scientific revolution where now they prescribe it to specific um, external variables. But, yeah. you know, everything goes in a circle. It's starting to show now that these same effects, these same spiritual natures are starting to be used um, in clinical practice now. Because it has to be culturally responsive. And if somebody uses that as their frame of reference, then it makes it more potent if you can use that um, to help support, you know, the person or whatever they're going through. Yeah, I mean, in reality, it all comes down to understanding people's narratives and stories and being holistic in your approach before you go ahead and, you know, try to place a label on that person. Yeah. Now, at the same time, there's also a, a, a time and a place for a label because, mm -hmm. uh, as we know from our training and, you know, working in California, so... 
you know, working as a school psychologist in Sacramento, California, to give some, you know, clarity on my history, Mm -hmm. you know, for about five or six years and working at a low income school, 70 percent free reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, it was mostly black and brown, mostly Spanish speaking population. Um, And I would see the power of the label in terms of protecting some of my students, too. Yeah. In terms of people not trying to say that kid is bad. I see. It has, you know, ADHD per se, yeah. on top of other factors too. Yeah. So at the very least, you know, California as at least has done somewhat of a good job in terms of building some protections and procedural safeguards yeah. for student nature. Um, yeah. In a school like this, you know, a label can also be protective of nature too because, uh, like I said, you know, since it's all kind of this one size fits all perspective, if you have, you know, one kid out of 18, because our classes usually run about 17 to 18, at all three levels, yeah. um, and that kid might have some difficulty sitting still or whatever, mm-hmm. and this could protect that kid as well as the financial investment and time, effort, and energy that the parents have put in to getting this kid into the, a top-tier international school by protecting them and putting it back on the school to serve the student to be a really, in, 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 in all essence of the world, word, an mm-hmm. inclusive school. Yeah, um, absolutely. So there's a time and place for that, and I mean, certain behaviors and you know, that I see in the international school community in terms of some of our students in comparison to special education, in comparison to 504, so your accommodation plan without the special education label. Mm-hmm. I do see that, that it's an important, you know, uh, you know, kind of consistencies yeah. between the that we have here and the students we have back at home and the benefit of having a label in order to put back on the teacher, to put back on the team, you know, them having to serve this child, differentiation, co-teaching, co-planning with your specialists in terms of how can I teach a kid that has a visual processing weakness on top of his ADHD. Whether it's a symptom of his ADHD, the visual processing, or cold, you know, occurring, you know, what can we do to build a better, you know, game plan for this student who, nine times out of ten, is the kind of elite learner that a school like this is preaching that they want Mm. and preaching that they produce. Mm. So uh, it's just trying to change that focus in terms of that an elite school, international school, a private school, Mm-hmm. Thirty thousand some dollars a year tuition, if yeah. not more. Um, just trying to change our perspective in terms of like we are truly, truly a global community. Yeah. We are engaged with all. We're trying to raise global citizens. That's one of our mantras, and also one of our mantras is the courage to you know make our, to help teach our students the courage to live their dreams. Yeah. Um, so all these kind of things can be you know impacted by you know using the right terminology or the right label. Yeah. Uh, you know, I can think of a, a good example. I'm sorry to cut you off right there. But um, I, I can think of a good example. Just this Friday, this past Friday, um, I was called in to another school site to do what's called a manifestation determination. Mm-hmm. Now, if you guys know what that is, a manifestation manifestation determination is a meeting where people attend. Okay, this is school individuals as well as the student's family. To discuss if a infraction, some type of infraction that got the student removed from their educational placement had anything to do with either the IEP or that student's disability. Now, we talked about why labels can be supportive sometimes. This was a perfect example of how, in a way, if this student had a particular label, it could have saved them from going up for expulsion. And I'm going to give you the scenario without giving you too much information. The student who was there for the manifestation got hit in the head with an orange. Two weeks later, he found his attacker, pushed him from behind while that guy was on the floor, kicked him a couple of times, kicked him in the face, dude got up, punched him a couple of times, the fight broke up, that was that. Mm -hmm. Go to the manifestation, he has a learning disability, or he has a label of a learning disability. Now, can you say that a learning disability is related to him planning out that attack. In in special ed world, that would be a stretch to make because specific learning disability usually has something to do with a processing deficit. And that's hard to say that planning something out like this um, has anything to do with any type of processing deficit. Now, the student, let's say they had a label of emotional disturbance where they had, um, you know, unusual reactions to typical situations. This could this could have stopped that student from getting expelled. Now, this student used to have the label of emotional disturbance. And as a matter of fact, the only way I knew it was because when I looked at his records, mind you, he doesn't go to my school. I saw that he went to a school that I was placed at 
four years prior. And I remember the case carrier and that teacher was uh, the teacher of the emotional disturbed students. The student had done so well that they had got themselves into the general ed population. They had no longer had the ED label. They were functioning well until they got hit in the head with that orange that day. Now they're up for expulsion, even though they made such progress. So had that label still been there, he probably could have got saved from expulsion. But at the same time, an emotional disturbed label can stop somebody's future from happening, such as owning firearms, such as working for the police or the fire department or operating heavy machinery, um, things of that nature. So, you know, the labels, it can be some tricky things, double-edged swords, Occam's razor, all of that. Uh, yeah. You know, because there's no real clear way to um, to get people services they need without saying you fit this category, you fit the bill. You know, so right. I mean, uh, especially with that kind of situation too. We're talking about emotional disturbance. Usually, that relates to like we know a mental health condition of some sort, right? You know, yeah. even though we're not you know bound by a kid having to have a diagnosis before placing them in special ed. Yeah. Or a diagnosis not necessarily equaling special ed. Yeah. I mean, go through you know research and all the all the long days and hours in college. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we know how that was, boy. We're talking about emotional disturbance. We're talking about you know maybe significant depression, significant anxiety, mm -hmm. significant PTSD. Okay. I mean, you know, we're talking about what schizophrenia, if I remember correctly, just off the top of my head. We're yeah. talking about absolutely serious baggage and so forth. Yeah. And so. You know, the proof for the you know the, the burden of proof for this kid not having to be labeled that way which is actually you know amazing because we know also the research shows too that most black and brown students particularly black males who get labeled emotionally disturbed they don't get that label off them. Uh, absolutely like, once they place in special education yeah is, you know our goal should be to have them accomplish their goals in the individualized educational program or yeah whatever, whatever. Yeah. Have them accomplish the goals and then to reduce, if not eliminate, services so they can be completely generated again, unless the need is that significant that they need to be in special ed. Absolutely. And, and by the way, this was a brown, um, a, a young brown man. Well, there we go. Yep. Uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Because we were saying, uh, you know, most of the time it's like almost impossible to get those labels off these students because mm -hmm. uh, either they got some sort of lifetime condition or. Uh, the school is not serving them properly to be able to give them the coping strategies they need. Yeah. Or in reality, you know, uh, they haven't had the financial uh, support or uh, or the financial resources necessary to get counseling outside the school, to look into possible medication regimen, to go to skills training, mindfulness, uh, even something like yoga. I mean, cost a little bit, a couple dollars here or there if you want to mm -hmm. really dive into that practice and so forth. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I mean, with a kid like that, mm -hmm. you would start to wonder, you know, you know, what could have been done differently. Yeah. And at the same time, too, as, as we know, with specific learning disability, you know, in the California Ed Code, we do have the attention process as well, which is basically your ADHD, you're not advanced significant ADHD diagnosis and so forth. Yeah. Uh, you know, that would be something else to consider in terms of factors, too. But, uh, That's a good point. When you have so many elements happening at once, mm -hmm. and then you're being brought into a case that you don't are not familiar with your kid as well. Yes. Okay, we're trying to you know build a bunch of, you know much of a strong case we can. Yeah. Because in reality, as we know with the research in terms of special education students as well as black and brown, mm -hmm. I mean our goal in, in general for any student is to try to figure out what's going on with the kid. Yeah. And to try to protect that kid not only from you know the systems at play but from themselves as well correctly mm -hmm. or correct. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's just Good those point. Things, all these factors are kicking in at once, and it's yeah. just kind of you know trying to you know not sink you know as that. practitioners back home or even here at Shanghai American School. Well, let me ask you: Do you have any students of African descent at the Shanghai American School, and how do they fare if you do? So we have uh, students of African as well as African American descent here at this school. Okay. It's not that many, though. Not that okay. too many. What's the percentage, if you could say, if you have that idea? Are those well, numbers? It's going to be less than 2%. Okay, it's be, okay. It's tiny. It's tiny. Okay. <laughs> I probably could count them on both hands. You know? What about in um, overall Shanghai period? You know, Shanghai, I don't know the percentages, but there's a lot of African and African-American brothers and sisters here. Hmm. And, I, and I say that because I've been in those spaces. You know, I've been doing, because on a side note, I do music, right? You know, I do oh, poetry. Absolutely. Rapping, okay. Singing kind of stuff, too. Yes, so, yes. The liberal you know, arts. Brother, uh, yeah, so my brother Terrence King, who's a kindergarten teacher here. Strong brother, proud brother from Baltimore. Oh, uh, excellent. That brother, shout out. 
and a brilliant uh, drummer. So oh, wow. Lucky, okay. You know, hang out with him and really bond with him mm. and you know, get in some of these spaces, you know, some of the bros, you know, you know, were around from his frat, uh, what do they call it? I want to say it's Omegas. I'm probably way wrong. So if the bros <laughs> hear me, please forgive me. <laughs> you, know, you know, they try to jump on you too. They don't play that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just being, you know, around strong black <laughs> individuals, even here in Shanghai, you know, and a lot of the brothers and sisters I talk to, especially the brothers here, both of African and African American uh, descent, you know, they say that, they, you know, Shanghai has been really, really welcoming and good for them. Okay. Because, you know, the established systems of racism that we have back home mm. are not existing, at least for our people here mm. in this country. Mm. So we're seeing more, you know, by some portions of the community in terms of our international, <coughs> uh, the Asian community. Yeah. You know, we're seeing more as, you know, from our image back home in terms of sports and music. And I see. And movies. Instead yeah. Instead of the whole perceptions that are perpetuated 24 7 on your day-to-day -day news feed and things mm. like that that's right uh, that's because we know i mean that's the simple brainwashing if you yeah. see it hear it consistent consistently and continually yeah. or continuously yeah uh first you start to believe that narrative of well to be a black person i must be a b c or d or all four and sometimes a b c and d are not going to be the best pro-social kind of aspects mm -hmm. in order to have a pro-social life in a society like we do know that we have back home. Now, Which brother is, Jeremy, you know, drip, goodbye. Uh, we're just gonna say. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna play devil's advocate because you know you have those people out there that say, "Well, not everybody who see what they see on TV is gonna do what they do. Not everybody who hear those songs on the on the radio are gonna go up and shoot people." But what you're saying, from a psychological standpoint, from a magical standpoint, is a process of conditioning, right? Is that kind of what you were getting at? Well, that's, yeah, it's conditioning. I mean, it's as simple as, uh, I mean, of course, it's not going to be one size fits all because we know humans, you know, concepts like resiliency and grit and, you know, the ability to overcome and also family, you know, factors into that equation, too. But uh, when we're talking about the systems that we have known since, have existed since the beginning of the country... And, you know, we're perpetuated even more so during Reconstruction. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, to me, it's just the same old two-step over and over and over and over again to a point where it's almost like, you know, white noise. Yeah. But then at the same time, I'm repeating the same song lyrics over and over and over again. How did this happen? I wasn't trying to listen to this song carefully. I heard Somehow that. this song has, has a pierced my uh, identity and my mind state. And, uh, so you saying it does have an effect. you saying hearing that stuff. Over and over and over again, from your perspective, from your professional and personal perspective, that stuff can have an effect on you. It can change your behavior. It can change your life. Sure. And, and, and the thing is, the other side of the coin, too, is uh, it's not just the songs or the movies or the news feeds and all this other stuff. It's the fact that we also are not being allowed spaces to be able to discuss these narratives that we're hearing. Because a lot mm. of times we hear brothers and sisters, you know, who are, you know, creating such, you know, art. You know, because yes. there is an artistic value to it if we really, really dig deep and look for it. You're absolutely uh, There's an artistic value to some of the stuff that I'm referencing in terms of the music, in terms of the movies, in terms of TV shows and, you know, memes and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But unless we're having that dialogue to really see, you know, the whole picture, okay, where is this coming from? Yeah. So like brothers at WA, man, they were talking about like, you know, we're giving you the narrative of what we're seeing. We're news reporters, basically, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even though we could say that, you know, glorifying that lifestyle probably isn't the best for our people mm -hmm. and our community. At the same time, if you really were talking with these brothers and giving them a space to discuss in terms of, you know, okay, where is this coming from? Yeah. Then we can really, really start to, you know, break down, you know, the signs uh, or the science behind all of these kind of, you know, you know, what we would call derogatory, you know, language or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, like NWA would say, you know, like even probably Migos would say to bring it to current events, not saying they're both one and the same, but <laughs> rappers are rapping about their life experiences and the things that they've seen and were growing up around, mm -hmm. then, you know, there's value to have the discussions and to get deeper with that and to really see, okay, well, why did these brothers feel like that they had to create this kind of art in order to break free and to break through? Yeah. And we also know that most of the music and the news media and entertainment, these are facts. It's mostly not run by people that look like you or I. That's, that's an excellent just, point. That, and, it, and it's mostly people who are not female. Mm -hmm, that <laughs> so too. That's a component of it. And mostly yeah. people who are LGBTQ+. Plus. Yeah. So bring out the component. It is mostly yeah. one type of people who are making the decisions in mm -hmm. terms of entertainment. 
yeah. and what they value in terms of pushing as art as well. Yeah. So, you know, I'm saying that this stuff could have a negative impact, especially when you're a young kid. I mean, uh -huh. I can remember being a kid, you know, visiting my family in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because both my parents are from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So we'd go back every summer. And I remember, you know, juveniles, you know, back that you know what up. Oh, yeah. And, uh, oh, you can cuss yeah, on I, here. That's all good. We know that cuss words okay. don't even exist anyway. I don't what, know what kind of audience this is. So I back heard. That up, back that ass up. up. That's right. You know, you guys can't funny records, baby, for the 9-9. <laughs> <laughs> for the 9-9, that's right. <laughs> but I, like, I, mean, I remember being there during the summer when that song hit mm. and seeing little cousins, like my little female cousins. Like, yeah. Like seven, eight years old. Backing back that ass up, up, huh? Up that song. Yeah. Oh, and also knowing that my female cousins also had single mothers. My my so these are my second cousins I'm referring to, so their mothers are my first cousin. Yeah. Uh on my mom's side, mm -hmm. you know, single mothers, you know, maybe a high school education, one of them, but most of them dropped out of high school. Okay. Had, you know, babies young and so forth. Yeah. So you see the other family component that we've been alluding to from both internationally here in Shanghai to the shy in terms of Chicago, mm -hmm. you know, the family component is such a big, big play to that. Okay. And so break down the family component, you allow, you know, these kind of songs, which are about reality perspective. They are a reality perspective for these folks creating this music. Mm -hmm. You allow that narrative to be the dominant narrative without really having discussions about, look, it's all right if you want to back your ass up. That's female mm -hmm. liberation. Your body, your choice. You do you. Mm -hmm. You know, and no man should, you know, be, you know, trying to tell you how to practice your sexuality or your female identity or whatever. Mm -hmm. But unless we're having those discussions in terms of, you know, our family units, our school units, our community units, mm -hmm. then of course it's going to be taken at its simplistic level, mm -hmm. which is, I like to shake my ass yeah. and I'm having a good time. So, okay, so, wanna... okay, so you you came up with a, a actual solution to the problem. You're saying the problem with the media bombarding you with messages 24-7 from the radio stations to your memes to your every type of feed is to have a place to discuss and get down deeper into what the meaning is um, and the direction direction and intentionality are behind these um, uh, this entertainment or this media is that what you're saying that's what i'm saying because i feel like you know in terms of the community aspect you know in terms of our people we're narrative we're, we're, we're storytellers hmm. you know we gather around and we break bread and we talk so you don't necessarily have to have a doctorate degree to be able to engage in those discussions. Oh, wow. Uh, we are big in terms of pushing critical thinking because yeah. we see where our society has gone, you know, even in a way backwards, even though in reality we didn't go backwards. Yeah. We just re-expose what has been existing in terms of bias and racial and, you know, sexist kind of behavior and uh, xenophobia mm. that yeah. existed since the beginning of the country. We just re-exposed it with our current politicians that are in office and making the decisions right now. Mm -hmm. But in reality, you know, critical thinking is a big part of that, but at the same time, just talking and having that community dialogue with everybody, where everybody's at the table, not only the doctorate level professional, but also, you know, the brother, you know, Uncle, uncle you know, Uncle Fred, who likes to do a two-step every once in a while. I see. You know, so, you know, hell of a life, so he can bring some knowledge to the game, too. Thank you. Or Sister Petty, who sits at the front as a deaconess, you know, yeah. at FT Baptist Church, mm -hmm. representing Louisiana, my uh -huh. family's church back there you down go. there. There you, you go. Know, uh, they all have narratives and stories and knowledge to share mm -hmm. where we can come together and deal with some of these concepts and build, obviously, coalitions. And, I mean, I'm not saying anything really in terms of solutions that haven't been discussed before. But, but brother, and you made a perfect segue, actually, into what I'm about to jump into right now because it's library time, which means I, I go dig into the ancient scrolls because you hit on something that made me have to go dig into the library and dig something up. You said we got to have spaces. First of all, you said we need to have places where people are not judged for who they are to come and discuss, correct? Yep. And have open discussions. And you said you you haven't said nothing new because it's been said before, right? So, let me see how long ago this was this has been said. Uh, you know, this is um I got the book of Patahotep here. And let me see how far back this goes because this is the, the Back there too. I'm just going to tell the <laughs> Oh no, no problem, no problem. Uh, oh, twenty, was it twenty five hundred before the Common Era? The the oldest book in the world. Okay. The first maxim or the first instruction says this: Do not be proud and arrogant with your knowledge. Consult and converse with the ignorant and the wise. 
for the limits of art are not reached. No artist ever possesses that perfection to which he should aspire. Divine speech is more hidden than greenstone emeralds, yet it may be found amongst maids at the grindstone. That's Uncle Frank that she was talking about. That's Aunt Betty and them that she was talking about. Don't have no PhD, but we'll drop a science on you of the science of life. Just like that. Yeah. You know. And, that's, and then the fact that you are able to date something like that and that concept, mm. I mean... I think that's the you know the lost art that we unfortunately are getting uh, further away from. That's right. Because even when I'm in the communities back home in Sacramento, in terms of the poetry scene, in terms of spoken word, yeah. the black community, you know, all that kind of stuff like that, you see how we segregate ourselves. That's a tell as old as time. Mm. You know, we segregate ourselves, and we try to be putting our nose up, you know, speak derogatory about our sisters, and then make our sisters speak derogatory about their sisters. I mean, I the see. whole divide and conquer perspective that has existed since man and woman has existed on this planet. Well, break it's break some of that down to us. Break some of that. Um, what do we need to look out for? Like, what terms are being used? What? Not that you're trying to put give it any more energy, but giving the people the information so they can discuss it and uh, not fall into that trap. Well, one of the words I dislike in terms of uh, acronym is thought. I hate that. Uh, okay. Ooh, bro. break that down, brother Jeremy. That hole over there. I okay. Hate that word. And I hate that terminology. Now, what is that hole over there? What is that? So that hole over there means that ratchet-looking woman who's probably flirtatious and letting everybody talk to her or whatever. That's a. And that's, that's a thought. A thought. So a T H O T H is that hole over there. Yeah. I see. So okay. It's common terminology in rap songs these days. The younger kids are posting about it on Instagram. Even some of these older heads that, uh, good Lord, they're too old to be talking like that, but they're still talking like that because they want to fit in with the times. Uh, I really feel like, you know, those are the kind of terms that, you know, are just breaking our kingdom down, man. They're just breaking our kingdom but, apart. But, bro, um, what are we going to say? No, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, like I said, it's the divide and conquer perspective. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then... Uh, as we know from the simple sciences, right, in terms of, you know, the ancient sciences, mm -hmm. when you're breaking down your queens like that, then, uh, I mean, you can never, never be successful because you Mother cannot. Earth is Mother Earth. Yeah. Everything that comes from the mom and the woman, yeah. I mean, that's the essence right there. So well, you, that's the five percenters, what they call them the Earths, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's you know, the Earths. That's just the Earths, man. But you know what? Uh, here you go, brother. You didn't hit two times on some ancient science. Um, this was Brother Jeremy's idea to come out with and discuss the Thoth. Now, this is my perspective on this Thoth situation. I'm glad you brought that up. Thought, people don't already know, um, is not only meaning your thought as your thinking, a past thought, right? T-O-T-H is a Greek word which stands for the ancient deity Jehudi, also known as Hermes in Greece, but in ancient Africa, his name was Jehudi, which represented all wisdom, Writing, sciences, mathematics, art, uh, music, um, the moon, the crescent moon was his crown. So you could always identify who he was because he had ibis head and he had the crescent moon. The ibis because it was almost like a, um, a writing utensil. And to be able to write and to write and to convey meaning through words is magical. Even to this day, it's very, very powerful. But to, to use thought to now describe a, a derogatory term for your woman, which is only being used in the African community, where it has originated from, to me, it's almost like it was inserted there on purpose by somebody who knew the ancient science and understand that words are powerful and wanted you to be using this magic against you. Um, that, you know, that's my perspective from the research that I've done. And, um, you know, I think people got to be very, very careful with that one. But I'm, I'm very glad you brought that one up. Um, while we're on that theme, I have one I want to bring up <laughs> since we're on that. <laughs> yeah. And this, it comes from the same um, era. And it's these people who think that calling people who have knowledge of their history or their ancestry, calling them hoteps. Mm. Now, my question to them from number one is, because that, that's, that's somewhat of an uh, ignorant statement, meaning that you're ignoring what, it, what a hotep is. Number one, a hotep is a greeting. So to call somebody a hotep is to basically, in, in English, call somebody a hello. That's a hello. Or that's, that's a um, hola. 
<laughs> or that say, you know, how would you say hello in Chinese? Say ni hao. That's a ni hao. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's essentially you walking up to an Asian person and saying, oh, you a ni hao, huh? Once they start dropping their science on their ancient history, you say, oh, you just a ni hao. So when you see a black person who says, I understand that I came from the continent of Africa. The ancient African civilization is Egypt. Oh, you're a hotep. I'm a greeting. I'm a hi. Let's get that out the way. Hotep can mean peace, satisfied. It can mean an offering that you leave for a deity or an ancestor. That is all because it's bringing satisfaction. So if people don't understand the history or the etymology of that word, I would suggest that they study it before they start to use it derogatorily. Um, yeah. When I'm sure it wasn't a black person who probably came up with that um, mm. because they wouldn't have used it in that that way. Number one is grammatically incorrect. Not that we the best in grammar anyway, but <laughs> number one, you wouldn't call somebody a greeting. Um, yeah. And number two, you definitely wouldn't call them your ancient civilization's um, most powerful greeting. So mm. those two words, thought and hotep. Are your vocabulary for the week, family? Go look those up and see what they really mean before people um, control your mind with words, which is magic, and have you thinking something that's really a fabrication. Oh, so, yeah. Words are powerful. We know that already. And, uh, you know, I think some of it, you know, like I said, it's just having those discussions of, like I said, where is the science behind these words and these languages and, uh, you know, some of the behaviors that we practice as well. Mm -hmm. I know only times that I really have seen Hotep uh, using a derogatory fashion is by some of our sisters mm -hmm. because they're uh, some of our brothers for being, you know, underlying uh, underground sexists in a way. Oh, I see. Say, well, you know, you you should wear your hair natural, my queen, or whatever. Uh -huh. Well, maybe a woman wants to wear her hair with whatever extensions or braids I or see. whatever she yeah. wants to do. She can do what she wants to do. It's her body, her choice, and I'm a true believer in that. Yeah. I know that cannot be a popular opinion by some of us, us brothers in the community and so forth, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't got time to be trying to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got time to be wasting to try to mold you in my image. I want you to be independent, strong, and able to care for yourself and take care of yourself because this world is crazy out here. Oh, sure. We're going to plant seeds and build together, like mm -hmm. you were saying, you know, from, you know, the 5 percent of theory, mm -hmm. you know, from the gods and the earth's perspective and so forth, mm -hmm. and build what we would call, if I remember correctly, the 5 percent is the one that have ultimate knowledge and truth mm -hmm. and education. We we're trying to talk to the masses in terms of the 75 percent, because the 15 percent, if I remember correctly, is the media, is the politicians, the mm -hmm. people that have a little bit of knowledge and power and use it to oppress. Yeah. And I don't got time to be telling you that you should wear your hair naturally and all this other stuff. Like, mm -hmm. do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Like, who? Why are we wasting our time with that? Yeah. You know, because we have been trained, unfortunately, by the oppressors. And mm -hmm. the oppressors can be anybody in terms of history, but in terms of American history, we know who the oppressors have mostly been, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. And so we're wasting our time being derogatory to each other. Yeah. Using this language that we're talking about, that in terms of the whole tab doesn't necessarily, according to you, mm -hmm. have a negative connotation and history to it, mm -hmm. then of course it's going to be lost. Yeah. I mean, knowledge itself is a common reframe in popular rap music. Mm -hmm. In terms of honest <coughs> rap, even, even your, you know, you know, snap, crackle, pop, or whatever kind of rap. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Little bubblegum rap, that's right. It's like knowledge itself is key, it's powerful. Mm. So, as like I said, I mean, some of the practices that we do as a community is emulating the oppressor mm. because we symbolize that with power instead mm. of symbolizing, you know, some of those ancient traditions and sciences that you are talking about, yeah. which we see every day. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not, it's not ironic or coincidental, in my opinion, regardless of your religious or spiritual background, that some of these things keep on popping up. Ooh. I don't think it's coincidence. Okay. I, 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 and the probability in mathematics, which is one of the most ancient of, of uh, sciences that yes. goes back to Africa, to the motherland, right? Yeah. Um, you know, those are numbers and the mathematics behind it and the science behind it is as close to divine as we can get. Mm. So the occurrences and those, you know, things that keep on popping up, Repeating. just like, wow, that's ironic. Oh, I can't believe that. Hey, yeah. no, it's not coincidental in my opinion. Yeah. That's just, and that's, and that's regardless of your spiritual and or religious affiliation. That's... Or if you're, yes, if you just believe in science. Okay. That still has a higher divine power to it, even if it's just science, even if we just die and that's it. I say. There is no purpose. No science is the purpose. If you ascribe to science, you ascribe to a belief system and a purpose. Yeah. You know, the, the thing of, you know, faith is uh, believing what you cannot see or necessarily touch. Mm -hmm. you know, science times is that. Yeah. You know, it's reality in terms of the ancient, ancient wisdoms and ancient religions from uh, not only from our people in Africa mm -hmm. to current 
religion practices of today. Yeah. It all has, you know, that, you know, history to that, you know, connective tissue. There you of, go. You know, and things like that. You know, so the funny part about that is the more that science comes out with their latest research into quantum theory and quantum mechanics, it's proven what <laughs> we have been saying since the very beginning that things that you see are always not there until you actually look at them and then they're recognized somehow. You know, uh, one thing can be in two places at the same time, um, although you're observing it in one place, it still exists in another location. So these are things that we have been saying that people thought. You know, we're, we're seeing ghosts and, and all these type of things, which we were, but you didn't understand that that was an ancient science. When people have been on the earth for thousands and thousands of years, they're going to learn some things. Um, so what you have actually is a civilization that's really new to being human that is now trying to run the entire world. So when they look at other practices, they don't understand these people have been through a whole lot already to understand certain things um, to be able to live this long. So to rehash it and say, okay, now I know something that you didn't know. Yeah, maybe they don't have it in their random access memory at that time, but it's in the genetic memory banks and they have already dealt with that. So, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's very interesting how these things, like you said, play themselves out. But I want to switch it up a little yeah. bit because um, we want to, you know, respect your time. And we got only a few minutes left. And I know the people, <laughs> they've got some, well, I got some questions for you. Um it, in politics, people in the West in general are ignorant for the most part. Um, and let me not even say that. We are misinformed. I'll put it that way. Um, what do people know about Xi Jinping and the government there? Is that a popular topic? Do people talk about it? Or, you know, is it is it a debacle like it is over here? What, what's the politics like over there? Well, I mean, uh, and that's the funny thing, because the reputation of this country is very strict. Okay. So you have you know limits on you know uh, democracy and freedom of speech and things like that. That is very true. Okay. That exists. Damn. You know, so anything that's a, that's a sending uh, a dissented kind of opinion uh -huh. against the ruling party is frowned upon. You might find yourself deported if you're you know a Laowai, which is a foreigner. Oh wow. Or you might find yourself you know doing some time. Uh, so if I go up and I say, um, I don't know if I uh, write on QQ or whatever the popular social media is, what's it called? QQ. QQ. QQ and WeChat, WeChat's another popular social media uh, uh, app. Okay. So if I tweet it or, or, or WeChat it, um, fuck Xi Jinping, what what would they do to me? Oh, they find me. <laughs> they find me? Okay. They would find you and have a talk with you, that's for certain. Ah, because, interesting. You know, you have a president here, you know, who is the law. And okay. You have a party which is the law. Okay. But this is one of the things that, you know, even in the age of Trump, you know, this is something that, you know, us as Americans really, really don't appreciate it much at, at all, mm -hmm. as much as it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, because even though things are bad right now, according to the majority of the people I've talked to of all types, mm -hmm. you know, of all races, of all financial backgrounds and religious backgrounds and so forth, uh, gender identifiers and things of that nature, um, at the very least, people can still protest. Yeah. They can still speak out against their government. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the fear is, and this is a healthy fear for some of our brothers and sisters, who are in the you know, struggle, whether they identify as liberal or they identify as Reagan Republicans or centrists or independents or Green Party or whatever. Um, the fear is that people like Trump and some of the people around him and supporting him are trying to erode some of those democratic practices that do exist in our country, even if we haven't practiced what we preach to the full extent of our capability in society back home. Hmm. Now, at the same time, things are not as restrictive and as bad as people make it out to be in terms of China. Mm. I've said, brothers and sisters I've talked to here, mm -hmm. they are very appreciative of this country. Okay. Things get done in this country. Okay. So when, when the, the party decides they want to build, you know, want to put money towards, you know, trying to stop out poverty levels, that they want to build new high-speed rails and trains and buildings and, you know, build up their capability, there's it, no question, they just do it. They just move forward. I see. And so Shanghai as well as China as well. I mean, it's just developing in such a quick pace because, you know, you have a unified front. So there is such a thing as groupthink being a positive thing, too, if we really think about it. Because mm -hmm. we are, you know, uh, proud of our individualism in terms of Americans and so forth. Mm -hmm. But we also see, like, you know, sometimes how that can cause conflict. So it's trying to find that happy medium somewhere where we can build consensus but still maintain or retain our individuality as well. It sounds um, like um, our, our political system is starting to move towards something similar to where you have 
uh, the top layer or the upper echelon of the politicians pretty much doing what they want when they want, not just saying, you know, uh, making up laws, which they are doing, but basically saying if we need to get infrastructure done, we're going to make that decision. And that's that. If we need to put finances towards education, we're going to take the money. We're just going to move it forward as opposed to, like you said, waiting for bills to get passed, waiting for it to you know come, rise up to the level of Congress or whatever the case may be. Um, when you have a government that can say, you know what, this is what I feel like doing and we're going to do it. Sometimes, like you said, things can get done a lot quicker. And I think that's kind of where we're moving if you see how things have been going <laughs> lately out here on the West. Yeah, and, and the, but the thing is, you know, even in a country like here, I mean, in terms of their principles, in terms of, you know, the People's Republic, when you hear that in, 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 the, in the title of, Ch the official title of China, the People's Republic, and socialism and communism by itself is thinking that the whole group of people, right? Mm -hmm. So they're considering everybody, and it might not be done in the way that you or I would do it, mm -hmm. or even, you know, our brothers and sisters of Chinese descent, but at the very least, it's in their doctrine to try to really consider all the people. Yeah. So you do see, you know, in terms of medic medicines and in terms of education, in terms of, you know, just, you know, financial, you know, building up the, you know, trying to eliminate poverty. They have really have been pushing, President Xi Jinping has been pushing, you know, trying to become, you know, one of the leaders in terms of environmentalism and so forth. Hmm. Um, China's not for play, man. I mean, because that way the air quality is pretty bad out there in China, right? So he wants to clean some of that up, I'm assuming. Yeah, so even in the past five years, from talking to my brothers and sisters, as well as my co-workers who have been here for 10, 15 years, air quality here in Shanghai and Beijing has improved greatly. Good, Because they good. have pushed initiatives in order to be a world power without question. Okay. And boy, right, this is the worst time for the United States to start to withdraw. In terms of, you know, okay, well, we got to have our voices heard at the table. But then we have somebody who's saying, well, I'm just going to take my ball and go home. That's basically the attitude I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. But not realizing that in 2018, we're a global community. And yes, we can, like I said, keep our individual identities as Chinese, as Russian, as, you, you, know, you, you know, United Kingdom in terms of the EU or Brexit in terms of, you know, the, the UK separating from the EU in terms of Africa. We all have our individual voices, but we all got to come to these common understandings and agreements. And when you have one country who is basically one of the most powerful countries, and is the new kid on the block, if we really think about it, relatively speaking, saying, I'm going to take my ball and go home, or I'm going to cause a tantrum. That doesn't look good for us mm -hmm. at all in right. terms of the global community. Right. So that's why a country like China is cutting edge. That's why a lot of brothers and sisters love this country. Let me that's ask why I am my stay here, because uh, at the end of the day, I'm seeing things in terms of, you know, you know the philosophies and the ideologies that you know what, we could start to use back home. Do black they, people have jobs uh, at a higher rate out there? Or, or is the employment rate higher for black people out there? Well, I wouldn't say it's higher for black people because a lot of black people that have come here have come here either for study or for work. Okay, so, okay. The unemployment rate for our black population is not that big. Are people... Talking, oh, go ahead, go uh, ahead. Yeah, we're talking about some of our more you know, ethnic minorities in terms of uh, Chinese descent or uh, Asian descent, yeah. you know, they, they do have work. It might be what we consider menial jobs, but yeah. they do have work. Okay. They always work. And then they do have a place to go home to. It might be tiny, yeah. but it's a place to go home to and enough money to be able to put some food on the table. And so That's right. Now, the issue is also that, you know, Shanghai is an international city, too. So even in the Minghong district, which I am in, which is more like an expat community, with some rural kind of elements in terms of our Chinese brothers and sisters here. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the rent prices are going up in this country mm -hmm. because this country in terms of, you know, Shanghai especially, is starting to make that global money, international okay. money. Yeah. People are starting to see that, okay, there's money to be made. So what you're here and having here is, you know, like a secondary gold rush. But as we know, sometimes the bubble can burst. Yeah. And that's the one thing to be very, very aware of. And I'm sure... I mean, the politicians here are savvy, smarter than, you know, anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and some of them make our politicians back home look like they're playing checkers, man. And that's not mm -hmm. even a lie. Mm -hmm. Because these people that are savvy, that have also been oppressed, if we think about Chinese history, too. Mm -hmm. They were oppressed by the British. They were oppressed by the Japanese. They were oppressed mm -hmm. by even Americans and so forth. Mm -hmm. So what really led to, you know, your Communist Party taking over this country was because they pretty much stuck it to the man, which was the big bully, oppressors. Right. Mm -hmm. And basically been able to create their own culture and their own society and become resilient from that. OK. So, also know, too, is that, you know, 
Power is power, any way you slice it. And, you know, we know absolute power can corrupt absolutely. That's an old adage that I mm-hmm. subscribe. And I'm pretty sure and aware that uh, the politicians in this country, boy, they're not for play, man. Mm-hmm. I respect them to the same degree. Okay. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here. <laughs> okay, so let me ask you this. Are, are police shooting black people down in cold blood in China? No. No, none of that going on. And you don't see guns as uh, prevalent here uh-huh. as you do back home. No. no. Okay. Crime is very, very limited here. But okay. Also, because, like I said, you have you know a government that's very, very you know uh you know on top of things in terms of like any sort of you know thing that might seem like it might cause some ruckus. Mm-hmm. You know, stop off. Oh, stop it out. Okay. So you'll see cameras everywhere. You'll see you know you know limitations on certain you know me social media and things like that. But mm-hmm. I mean, the un- you know, unfortunate reality is the proof's in the pudding. You got a billion plus people. Yeah. You're not seeing the same amount of crime and terrorism and aggression that uh, our, our relatively small country compared to China is experiencing every day. Mm. Every day. I hear you. Like I said, it's that group think mentality, but also what can we do in terms of Americans to maintain and retain our individuality as well? And that's, you know, something that has come forward from the beginning of time too as we've developed in terms of these, you know, tribes, if you will. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're the tribe of Zulu and so forth and now become the tribe of Africa versus the UK and Europe, if you will. And then Asia and China versus Russia or the Soviet Union or America. I mean, we're still in tribe. We're still in tribe times, right? Mm-hmm. You know, bigger, bigger, bigger sense of the word. But uh, yeah. you know, it's helped humans to survive as long as they have. Yeah. Whereas you know, other species have died off because we are just animals when we really, really break it down. Yeah. You know, the, 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 to uh, write and communicate verbally and read is what separates us in a way mm-hmm. from the animal and also our higher quote unquote higher level cognitive ability. Mm-hmm. Um, but what has allowed us to survive as a species without going extinct, like mm-hmm. most of our, you know, other animal brothers and sisters in the animal kingdom. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dinosaur to the lizard. <laughs> I know. Oh my goodness, the lizard people, boy! I tell you, that reptilian, that reptilian brain, coming to get you. But okay, well, let me ask you this. Um, I, I want to get into this now. I don't know if you heard, but just recently. Not only did Kate Spade, the famous handbag designer, commit suicide out here in the United States, but Anthony Bourdain, a good friend of hers, did the same thing maybe a couple of days later in the same fashion. Now, we put out a blog post called, um, Baby, I am not afraid to die. And it was about black male suicide and how to prevent it. Um, Now, I want to get some of your expertise into this particular area because it seems to be rampant right now with it in the media everywhere with um, 13 reasons why out with um, you know everything that's going on what do you think you know in the suicide clusters you know as we're seeing um, what's your perspective on all the suicides and you know where do we go from here what we're seeing is that uh, unfortunately that uh, people are not taking mental health as seriously as they should back home in terms of politics in terms of funding in terms of education, it's uh, still seen as a taboo. You know, we still live in a society as pull yourself up by the bootstraps. But uh, who was it? I think it was Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. I'm going to misquote this, so please forgive me, audience. But, uh, you know, how can we pull our boots up, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps if we don't have any boots? Mm. You know, um, so what you're seeing is in, 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 in the unfortunate circumstances of, you know, high anxiety, high depression, Mm -hmm. high whatever other mental health related illnesses that might be going on because it doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily have to to be depression. Yes. You know, from the research, you can have a person who is highly anxious, PTSD, things of that nature that uh, the pain, you know, and people forget that mental pain is real pain or can actually cause physical pain. We just saw, as a matter of fact, the Cleveland Cavaliers coach, Tyron Lue, go out due to anxiety as well as Kevin Love Go out this year due to anxiety issues. And DeMar DeRozan coming out. DeMar DeRozan, that's a good point, yes. You know, Compton's own, right? Uh, Compton's from City of Compton. <laughs> 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 He's from Compton originally, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Compton High School. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, we, what we're experiencing is the fact that people do not want to show weakness. Yeah. And assuming that being... You know, somebody who has a mental illness, because these are people that had actual diagnosis, if I remember correctly, at least with Kate Spade, 
Uh, okay. I don't know about Anthony, but I know Kate Spade, her husband came out and said that she's been suffering from anxiety and depression pretty much, you know, as long as he's been married to her. Okay. Um, the demons, and even going back to last year, Lincoln Park, uh, Chester Bennington. That's a good point. No, uh, yeah. Chris Cornell from, uh, if I remember correctly, Sound, I think it's Soundgarden, Sound. Black Hole Sun. That one hurt me right there. Wow. That's one of my favorite songs for karaoke, for I, everything. Oh, I mean, wow. I heard that. That man's voice and the heartache and the in my head, in yeah, my right. head. <laughs> yeah, boy, that's the song right come, there. Come. <laughs> yeah. So what is anxiety? What is that? When, when you say uh, people have anxiety, a lot of people say, well, what does that even mean? When you think about, you know, the, 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 the paralysis of not wanting to dive into the unknown or they're always going back to the worst case scenario. Or, you know, so it can be panic, it can be restless, mm. it can be even then, you know, something significant as performance fears. You mm. know, just the fear is so great that it starts to impede your major life functions or activities. Mm -hmm. So being social, working, interpersonal mm. relationships, family, I mean, just being so overwhelmed that you just, you know, and this is me saying this just from working with people, you know, who both, you know, students at anxiety as well as colleagues with anxiety because I don't have that diagnosis mm -hmm. even though I might have some fears or whatever it's not to a point in my opinion that is to you know that is impacting my day-to-day -day life you know uh, in your opinion so, no I'm just you know, <laughs> 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 I might be in denial you never know <laughs> both of us I'm going to admit my uh, my you know biases and weaknesses if you will <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> I heard you that. Know, but, uh, Be humble. You know, sit down. <laughs> sit down. <laughs> that's but right. Just, you know, talking to people and working with people is just that's how, in my simplistic definition. No, that's a good see, point. You know, that's uh, that's how I see anxiety really manifesting, and then the depression of I'm not good enough. I'll never be good enough. I'm a burden on my family. I'm a burden on my loved ones. How could anybody love me? You know, uh, every day is gloomy. Every day, every day is crap. Every day is shit. I mean, uh. Mm -hmm. You know, depression, I mean, we, and we've all had touch of feeling blue. It just hasn't gotten to a point where it's a constant every day. There, we're not going outside. We're not trying to interact, you know, that we f constantly feel tired, that we're constantly putting a smile on our face to try to not have people know that I'm struggling, I'm suffering, because either A, I don't want to show weakness, or B, I don't want to be a burden on people. And you hear that in terms of, like, some of the students I've worked with who have had suicidal ideation is that, you know, suicide is not their way of an uh, easy way out. It's just that I'm constantly in pain. I'm constantly suffering. Don't you understand that life is tough already? And then you expect me to stay around for family and friends who, in their reality, whether it's sometimes true or sometimes not true, they might, might not actually care about them. Because we do know that there is a family component to it, whether genetically and or in terms of that social emotional conditioning of the household. And regardless of if it's here in Shanghai with affluent families or back in the school I worked at, Natomas High School in Sacramento, California, once again, like I said, mostly black and brown, low income, 70% free reduced lunch, high, you know, English as an additional language population or ESL, English secondary as a secondary language. I mean, those factors of anxiety and depression are there. And I, and I see it, you know, not only with students, but I see it with staff. I, I work with staff, you know, both home and here. That you just see, you know, how much the pressures of everyday living and everyday life just continuously grinds on them. And it, mm. I mean, it grinds on all of us. Absolutely. And it's kind of dig the purpose. What is the purpose? What is the purpose for me to keep going if I'm always in pain? And if mm. this is, you know, so, so tough for me and I'm already having this kind of distorted cognitive distortions in terms of, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not worth it. I'm worthless. Nobody cares about me. You know, I'm feeling hurt, I'm feeling rejected, afraid, sad, distrustful, however you want to determine, uh, you know, those kind of symptoms of thinking when it comes to anxiety and the depression. I mean, That's a good I, point. You know, a lot of times what I like to do when I'm describing to a group of people what anxiety is, as I say, anxiety is anticipating something that has not happened yet. And just like you said, to the point where it, where it is, it's limiting, severely limiting your everyday life functions. For example, the prom is coming up. You worried about tripping 
and falling and then your dress coming up and then everybody seeing your g-string and then putting it on snapchat and then circling around the school and then now you the whole of the of the school but guess what all of that was made up in your head and don't even really exist but that literally can debilitate some people to the point where they will not go to the prom they will not they will miss out on that social interaction because of something that really doesn't exist something in the future that doesn't exist right now in the present and that's why meditation that's yeah. why um, being putting yourself in the moment, taking those deep breaths, recognizing who you are in that time and space is so important. Because like you said, sometimes we get lost in time and space and we have to reorient ourselves in order to, to flow smoothly. You know, it's all yeah. about, like you said, just a, a nice, smooth flow. Yeah. You know, I, so I find that very interesting. And that's a good point that you made up about both anxiety and depression. So, you know, we're coming up on the hour mark, and it's been a, a wonderful discussion. We didn't touch on everything from suicide to anxiety to depression to Xi Jinping to, wow, every, everything. Hotep and, and Tahuti and, ta and thoughts. So, <laughs> everything. So, I, I, I forgot to tell people I'd be joking, uh, kind of half joking. I mean, I'd, I'd hang out with President Xi Jinping any day, man. We'd have a <laughs> or whatever I'll kick it with him anything man. that's so right that's <laughs> right and you know, that's right well we can't wait to have you back to talk about you know some something else that's going on like the autism rates like some bitcoin like uh, the tech bubble that's going on in China so yeah, we definitely want to get sports out there you know we want to get some more perspective from you in a, in a very near future yeah, I got, yeah and I got to talk about you know how you know the Golden State Warriors and oh. famous, famous teams here in China they ain't trying to play, man. That's Wait, right. It's a big legend out here in China, man. Yeah, Is man. he? Strawberry, Stephon Marbury, man. Dude, oh wow. Yeah. So Clay Thompson is holding it down in China right now, huh? He's, he's big in China, boy. Wow. He's got his own spiel, really? Own commercial. They they have a whole hashtag, you know, China Clay. So he's he's basically um, KD of the United States right now, or the LeBron of the United States. Is what Clay is in China. Clay is big, man. So wow. Clay Thompson, like I said. You know, and then uh, Stephon Marbury is like really, really big out here. Okay. Very big. Well, big. family, I bet y'all wasn't expecting to hear that little piece of information on Jedi Learning today. Well, guess what? You just yeah. got it. So, yes, Stephon Marbury is like the Michael Jordan in the way of China. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> well, brother Jeremy, do you have any any projects coming out? You got any way that people get a hold of you? Any last things you wanted to say? Well, you know, uh, I'll, I'll say this real quickly in terms of like what got me to this process of being here overseas. You know, I knew uh, since uh, 2010, I met brother Dr. Timothy McCargue. You know, met him in 2010, told him I had uh, ambitions to want to travel the world, but I was just starting my school psychologist program mm -hmm. at Sacramento State after completing my undergrad at UC Davis. And he told me about international schools because oh, wow. he served as a school psychologist and school counselor in Indonesia okay. with his wife there. And that opened up the door, like we're talking about meeting people and being open to narratives mm. and stories in order to investigate this international school game. Yes. Whereas the situation, depending on how good the school is, because this is, like I said, top tier. Shanghai American School, I've enjoyed my time here, and they got great people in college. Mm. This is top tier living, taking care of your housing in terms of your rent. So you're pocketing money that way. If you're able to, you know, get the right kind of tax people that are helping you out, mm. you might not be paying any taxes, whether state and or federal taxes. If you know the right people to talk to back home, and it's all legal, it's all fair, as long as they're taking care of business, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, so you're saving money that way. Hmm. You're getting professional development without having to beg for it. School supplies and protocols like we're testing that we do without having to beg for it. Yeah. I mean, you're getting, you know, like I said, utilities paid for, you're getting all of that. That's not every international school, mm -hmm. but at this international school, like I said, top tier, I got lucky because they had a school psychologist position, and there's not many of us here, brother, in terms of school mm -hmm. psychologists in the world. I heard so that. You get on that way, on that path, talking with Dr. Tim, talking with other people within the international school game, as well as going to international school services, which is at ISS.com, I was able to get myself out there and get this job here. Uh, so that's just wow. something for us all to consider because, like I said, the world is big. And that's one way as an educator, if you're brave enough. Yeah. I mean, this process probably would have been a lot better if I came with a significant other. I'm not going to lie about that. I yeah. came, out of, came out of a long-term relationship, and I don't have regrets about making this choice, but I do have regrets about doing it myself. Yeah, Because I hear you. at the end of the day, it's good to be, have a partner yeah. who understands you, understands your being, understands your soul, yes. to be able to 
give you that support. When that's, you're right. Training, that's right. That's right. That's what I'm to think about too. So that's advice to people who may be in your position, who may want to make that same move from the United States or from anywhere, matter of fact, into China. Exactly. I mean, okay. In China, any international school around, because like I said, this is the, like many people say, the best kept secret. Okay. But the thing about it is, it's not so much a secret, but also that bravery. We were talking about anxiety mm-hmm. before, right? Yeah. So anxiety is what the thoughts I was having before coming here. What if I get jailed? Or what about it mean being able to get on the internet and talk to my loved ones? What if something happens back home? Mm-hmm. You know, what if I, you know, say the wrong thing or I'm not good enough at my, enough at my job? Those kind of everyday anxieties that if we don't nip in the bud can bubble up and become even bigger and impede you from experiencing this life of, you know, of exotic, you know, make believe in honey, which I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah. In the living, breathing, and appreciative of not only this school, but this country for mm-hmm. allowing me to be able to be here and do me and still be me and still be able to teach the, you know, the youth, the truth, you know, and all that stuff like that. Well said. Um, well said. Yeah. Well, if the so people want to reach you, Jeremy, well, how would they reach you if they want to get more of your work or just want to, you know, con- contact you for more information? How could they get in touch with you? So in terms of music, you're going to look at G-M-I-L-E, gmile.bandcamp.com. And that will have some information in terms of how to contact me. Perfect. I'll also have some of my music and some of my recordings as well. And then, uh, you know, just uh, hit me up in terms of like, you know, this Outlook. I have an Outlook.com. It's just, uh, you can share it with the folk. It's just that J-D-E green with an E at the end, 85 at Outlook. Dot com. So that's the Microsoft, uh, you know, uh, website, email website, and so forth. But other than that, that's the best way to holler, man. You thank know, you. Can holler through you, brother. <laughs> thank, thank you, brother. Well, we appreciate you coming on, spending your time with us. You know, you know, it's a big time difference, and you made it work. We've been trying to put this together for weeks, and we appreciate yeah. you. We can't wait to have you back on, like we said. And you know, you have a a good day, brother, and we're gonna have a good night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you have a good night. I'll have a good day. Brother, we're going to connect very soon and hopefully break some bread pretty soon in person. We sure will. Hit me up when you get down here, all right? Oh, you know I will, man. All right, man. All right, but easy. Take care of yourself. To all, to all that listen to this uh, very fruitful discussion, God, it, 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 much appreciated because sometimes you can feel outside in the world, alone in the world. Th- that's right, brother. Well, we always hear. Jedi Learning is always here. Bobby Kintu is always here. If you ever want to reach out, you know that. Hey, I got you, man. All, all right, man. All right, man. Have a good one now. You as well. All right, man. Take care. Fascinating information, very enlightening, um, beyond words sometimes. And some of the things that we went into uh, could have been hard to follow for some, but hopefully we dug deep enough that it sparked your interest in a whole new area that you may not have ever considered prior. So a big shout out to Jeremy Green for doing this, coming on the show and blessing us with his words of power and words of wisdom. Um, and it was good to hear a little bit about his musical prowess too, because that leads us into our next section, which is two standard deviations. standard deviations above the average is just a mathematical way of saying somebody is a genius so in this case it's a psychological term that we use 
for people who we find to be extremely brilliant. And the sixth liberal art of music is where we're headed for this one. And I want to shout out a brother by the name of Dwayne Thomas. And he is a bass player, and I guess you could say a vocalist, out of Memphis, Tennessee. Good old Benefer, right along the Nile River, uh, Mississippi River. Catch my drift. And he does uh, mock and imitation videos where he plays the bass along popular YouTube clips are popular clips um, that are true and it's absolutely amazing to watch this man um, so amazing are his YouTube clips that I actually went and listened to some of his albums it was even more blown away um, he was brought to my attention because of a song I heard on a station out here called KCRW and the single was called tell me that this love ain't real and just listening to it I knew it was something interesting about the music that I was hearing, but very uh, knowledgeable and very complicated and sophisticated. So I said, let me go ahead and look at some more of his work. And I'm so thankful that I did that. I share them with everybody I come across and I even got a chance to pick up some of his albums. Uh, Angels and Demons is one. And I can't think of the name of his other album, but he has about five of them out. But I uh, might play some clips here just so you guys get a feel for some of his music but he goes by the name Mono Neon so if you ever get a chance check him out you know we are big into the seven liberal arts and whenever we get a chance to share a genius in the area of music we will do so and in order to keep the lights on in the building and to keep providing you with the genius that we're trying to provide you with we do need support as well uh, as you know it's a tough time out there and we know that your hard earned pennies and nickels uh, could better be used on rice and beans and water and toilet paper and even uh, Popeye's chicken sandwiches. But if you can spare a dime or some time, we appreciate both. Uh, you can go to our website and sign, website, excuse me, and sign up for our monthly uh, newsletter or blog. Uh, you can make a one-time donation. There is a donation button right there on the website. Um, you can purchase a product. You know, we have the uh, timelines up there. And like I said, we want to start putting more things like planners and various types of notebooks and things that you guys can use on a day to day basis um, and anything else you can think of. So if you think you can uh, write blogs or if you think you can do a jingle um, or if you have skills already in doing that, we'd love to have your support um, spread, you know, spread this information through word of mouth. Let people know about the show. Um, and also do a review if you can review us either in our comments on any of our um, media sites please go ahead and do that because that does help us to uh, reach an expanded audience and especially if you want us uh, to continue to do the work that we do as well as have other people see the work that we do uh, because it's for the overall good so those of you who already support us, we want to thank you for allowing us to provide you with this useful and relevant information. And for those of you who have yet to do so, we send a friendly invite for you to come and participate. And that pretty much wraps up the show for the day, Village. It's been a wonderful wonderful experience sharing it with everybody out there and uh, being able to provide a valued service to the village i'm honored as a matter of fact um, especially by all the support we continue to get on youtube and instagram and the various social media sites and just in person um, getting dabbed in all of our learners out there keep doing your thing all the parents that we work with Keep your head up. You are doing a wonderful, wonderful job by investing in your child's education and opportunity, uh, especially in a provider that is um, forward thinking and uh, provocative, cutting edge. And that's where you need to be if you're going to be in an environment like this where there's nothing but opportunity ahead of you. 
the world is changing immediately, extremely rapidly, like it always does. So nothing happens gradually and slow. It usually happens. Bam! It hits you, and then you gotta pick up the pieces. You better start picking up the pieces. You better get your hustle man on. And shout out to those parents who are out there doing that. Picking up the pieces. So, in order for us to keep doing what we're doing, we hope that you would also continue to support us. Uh, you can go to our website, hit the donate page. You can also go to our website and go to our shop and look at some of the products that we have there from the timeline scrolls put together by our buddy Enoch Hankerson uh, to some of the books that we have coming out. Hopefully, we will have our first planner up on the website by the time this drops. And we will also follow that up with a series of planners as well as workbooks. So be on the lookout for those as well. So, once again, um, keep your head up. Raise your jet. Keep your eyes peeled. Keep your Jet Eye 2020 vision going and not stopping. Um, because the forces that are out to stop you. Uh, can only be defeated by somebody with a plan, somebody who's unwavering, uh, a will, a power, a way with words, and an ability to uh, withstand anything that's thrown at them. And that's you, because you are getting the wisdom as the ancients gave to us. So without any further ado, this is the Jedi Learning Show with Baba Q2 age of Aquarius in the uh, sun sign of Pisces in my favorite season of spring uh, we'll see you soon